Glad to see all of you here in Fort Worth, be here uh, with us. And uh, this is, you know, I was thinking about a couple of things. This wasn't part of my presentation, but I'm going to share it. As I, you know, the Burns family have known all of these guys. They know Alan and, and Scott, and they don't have a clue what I'm fixing to say. And so there's nobody in this room any more scared than they are, I promise you, except for me. So, uh, and, and Scott, uh, I went, as an optimist, we need to always look for positive things. And you don't have to worry about me coming and taking your farm away from you. You can have it. And, and, and Gabe, I'm not going to come to North Dakota and try to take yours either. I can't stand that 200 plus days of freezing. I, I'm not doing that. So let's get started here. Um, first of all, I'm not a speaker. This is my absolute first PowerPoint presentation, so we're probably going to be in a wreck before this is over with. We're not going to give you a lot of facts and figures. I'm just going to talk to you about what we do on our farm. And, you know, sometimes I think it's important as we go through life that we ask ourselves, are we wrong? Could we be wrong? And I think that's important as we do this. That's how we learn if we think about what we could be doing that's wrong. I don't have to worry about that because my wife said I'm never wrong, so I can take comfort in that. So, where we're located, uh, this is the current drought monitor map of Texas. We actually are located on the Red River, right up very north. Uh, actually, you may have read some things in the news about the BLM trying to take uh, land from ranchers. We own some of that land in the Red River bottom. <coughs> Uh, you will notice that that dark brown area, and that's the most severe section of the drought monitor map, and we're located on the very edge of that. If you look back at the one before that and one before that, that brown just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we were just in the heart of it. So that's, that's where we've been. And uh, although we've had some rain, <clears throat> we feel like things are much improved. Uh, we uh, are still in the D4 drought. But... Uh, we, we are optimistic about the situation we're in. Uh, we've got uh, uh, water in ponds. We didn't have that a year ago. We've got uh, green uh, crops growing. We've got small grains growing. We're right grazing cattle. So we're very optimistic about where we're going. A little bit about our story. I'm going to tell you what we do. We raise uh, small grains, uh, stripping wheat. We raise cotton. That's my son, Kevin. He helps me. Uh, there on the farm. We uh, have a mother cow operation. I hear these guys talk about trying to put cattle back in their operation, and we've always had them there. And it was always, uh, we've always worked them in. It's just been a part of our lives. Uh, this is a little group of calves that uh, we were raising. We had a, a group of black uh, cows that were pretty good quality, and we brought some Hereford bulls and put with them. We're trying to raise our own black bull, the replacement heifers. It's our first time to try to do our own replacement stock. Uh, this is uh, stalker cattle that we, uh, this is actually shipping day 2013. This is just a picture of some we took. I think Alan mentioned earlier, it doesn't take enough pictures. I obviously don't either. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of hard to scrounge some of these up. Like I said, this was shipping day. We had the trucks lined up and we're all excited because we're fixing to get paid. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've also uh, used an agronomist, and I've had an agronomist tell me, you need to get the cattle off of your operation. You're never going to achieve maximum yields if you've got the cattle out there compacting your soils. And what I've told him is I'm not interested in achieving maximum yields. I'm interested in achieving maximum profitability, and I'm not going to get rid of cattle. That's just not part of what we're going to do. We raised some other crops. This is a spring canola this year. Uh, we've had, uh, we've uh, had a little bit of experience with canola, it's been tough. We've been trying to do a lot of these new things in the middle of this drought. Uh, we've been in about four or five years now. Last year, all of our canola in the area froze out. And uh, it turns out a lot of that uh, damage is because the canola tries to grow too much 
and it gets the crown above uh, the, the, the soil and it freezes. So we're actually trying to, here trying to control growth with some chemicals and shut it down and see if we can stop some of that freeze damage. We don't seem to be having those problems this year. Like I said, we've had some rain. It's amazing how much better freeze damage is and some of these other things when you have moisture. And that, so that's helped that. Uh, we've raised mallow in the past. We haven't raised any mallow this year. Uh, this was one of the better years we had. Uh, we've raised sesame. Sesame was uh, a bit difficult to raise in the uh, drought, but uh, this year we had some rainfall and sesame was better this year. Uh, in our cattle operation, both the mother cows and the stalkers, where we need hay, uh, this year was new for us. We're in fact uh, wrapping wet hay and making baleage out of it, and we have not fed any of this yet, so we don't know how that endeavor is going to go. Uh, though we always have dry hay for both uh, mother cow and stalker cattle operation. We always try to grow some experimental things. This is some flax we're attempting to grow. We don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, it's just, we'll, we'll see. Uh, this is, it just come up, it's pretty young, and it's got some freeze damage on it, so, uh, you know, we'll just see how that goes. Uh, this, uh, we had a little accident here. We spilled over a bag of our seed. We hadn't picked it up yet, and I'm going to get a picture of that. And this is uh, black oats. Uh, they're not black, but they're sure chocolate brown. And so that was something totally new for us. We're excited about using those uh, in our cover crop mix, especially for forage. It's supposed to be more of a coarse, denser forage, and uh, would be, be better for our soils. And so we're excited about using those in cover crops. And then, uh, you know, also for, you know, uh, uh, in, in uh, our grazing system as well. New to us also this year, which we haven't planted, is going to be spring yellow peas. We, uh, these are kind of experimental for us again, and we don't know how those are going to go, but we're excited about trying to move to some kind of different cropping systems. We, you know, I can remember a time when you get, somebody just said, what kind of crops can you all grow there? We'll say, well, we grow wheat, cotton, sometimes mild old hay, and that was it. And we would tell people, we can't grow anything else. So what we're, we're trying to learn in, in this soil health the environment that we're in, and as we look for diversity, what can we grow there? And I think we really didn't know because we weren't ever open-minded enough to look. Uh, also, uh, uh, with a lot of cattle, well, we need fencing. Uh, these are some new fences we constructed. If you can see the back of those uh, steel posts, they're lined with grasshoppers. So that, that seems like a drought always brings that on. So uh, we've been in that drought pretty good. Uh, we've been building some uh, gates and corners. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've seen trying to get our, uh, bring value to our livestock operation. We've built a couple set of pens. Uh, also, with the livestock, we always have issues with water. So we've had a lot of ponds that were dry in this drought. Here is us cleaning out uh, one of those ponds, and I don't know how many of those things we cleaned, probably into the 20s or 30s. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, if you want it to be better, you better do something with it today. That's the way we look at it. Uh, cleaning out a pond is not going to fix anything for this year, but it'll just get you ready for the next drought. And we know it's going to come, so we're just trying to get ready. So needless to say, we're busy out on the farm. We're always doing things. Uh, and let's just get into some of these topics a little bit. Our topic today is soil health. Obviously, maybe you have some interest in that because you're here. Uh, I think if there's been a mistake made as we talk about these things is maybe we've placed, initially there was too much emphasis placed on no-till. And it would seem like the always discussion was, should I till or not till? And it was always seemed like a cost discussion, which is cheaper. And, and then I think that was always the wrong uh, discussion to have. Uh, maybe because we didn't know much else about the discussion. And the guys that have chosen to go down a no-till path have learned that there are other factors that become far more advantageous than cost when you go to looking at a no-till mm -hmm. environment. And, and that's what I think we're hopefully trying to consider today. Uh, I like to think about what's going on as we travel down this road, this path. I like analogies. I like to make analogies to other things and it helps me make sense of them. 
I like to think about it, if we were to just ask you people to get up and let's walk out of here and get in your cars, and we're going to drive to Oklahoma City. Now, as we do that, we're not going to all get there at the same time. We're going to be moving at different speeds. People are going to be passing people. Some people are going to stop and rest. Some people are going to eat. It's just, you know, some people are just going to, you know, obviously we're going to be moving at a different pace. And then also, there's going to be some of you just get, leave here, get in your car and say, to heck with it, I'm going south, you know. And that's fine. That's what it's about, is just that walk down this highway, that path that we're on. And I think that's really what we want to uh, talk about today is, and you see that with Gabe and Scott and myself, we're not all on this highway at the same place. We're at different places, moving different speeds, with different things in mind, but however, our goal, healthy soil, is a positive goal. So, as we talk about that, we want to discuss with you just a little bit our journey down this road today. And I'm going to just pause with the slides a little bit and tell you kind of where I got to here. It was long in about the mid-80s, I convinced, I was in a farming partnership with my father, and I convinced him because we were raising a lot of cotton, and we had a lot of erosion from that cotton. It was typical back then to put out a yellow herbicide, to double work that yellow herbicide, and by the time we got to planting, we had the soil extremely bare, and when you got a summer rain, you just had tremendous erosion. I can remember taking a bulldozer, patching terraces, patching washed out ditches, patching the herbicide and planting. And it just made me sick that we were doing this. So I convinced him, I said, let's, we had heard a lot about no-till corn, so I said, let's try some no-till. So we didn't know anything about it. We got the county agent to help us. We actually uh, put the wheat stubble through the summer with atrazine. And it come time to plant next year, we just had our 1700 year plant. There was never any no-till attachment on it, no down, initial down pressure. And so we thought, well, we need to plant this crop with it pretty wet. So we chose to do that, and of course we planted it wet. It crusted on us, we didn't get it up, and, and my dad said, well, this is a failure. So we just need to plow this and, and, and plant it right, and let's get down the road. And so that's what we did. Now, we have a saying in our area, you can't no-till because you haven't buried your father yet. And that's kind of <laughs> sad for But there's a little bit of truth to that. You can't take on an endeavor like this with somebody leaning over your shoulder every day telling you that you're wrong, that it's not going to work. And I would encourage you, if you're in some kind of a father, son, or partner operation, and you're thinking about doing this, and everybody's not on board, it's not going to work. So I'd really encourage uh, you to think about that. Then, in about the turn of the century, about, I think, look, think about that. How many of us can say I was alive at the turn of the century? I mean, I, I can remember when Y2K was a big thing. You know, when they turned 2000, all the computers were going to crash and all that stuff. So, uh, but along in about then, we started using rotational no-till. We were planting using a small grain cover, we would graze that a little bit, we would maybe terminate it, and then we would uh, plant cotton in that. Then we would immediately go back to tillage for our wheat. So we did that for a while, and we saw benefits from that. Then actually in 2005, we bought our first no-till cedar, and we said we're going to be full no-till. Now, I wasn't as smart as Dave. I didn't sell my tillage equipment because I thought this might not work. <laughs> And so what happened, we actually got about four years into no-till, and we were having some real problems with tumble windmill grass. And some of you may know what that grass is. It comes out of your pastures, and it's a pretty tough one. And we couldn't control some of that grass. So we had a neighbor that hooked up to a chisel plow, a no-till farmer, and he was plowing some of his, and we said, man, that's the answer. So we hooked up to a chisel plow and swept some of those fields and haired them down and kind of smoothed them up and had it looking real good, but we didn't help our problem. We killed the grass that year. 
but it was back next year thicker than we ever had it because all we did was plant the seed of the grass that was out there. So we we just provided a perfect seed bed, a perfect environment for that grass to do well in. So uh, we just found out we had a problem, but we had to find another solution to the problem. And that solution was to do a better job of killing grass. We had to kill it when it was small, we had to be more dedicated, we had to get the right chemicals, the right rates. We just had to figure out a better way to get the job done, but tillage was not the way to get the job done. And, uh, 2010, we bought our first stripper header. Uh, Jeremy, let me tell you something. If you're going to go home and talk to your wife about buying a stripper, <laughs> include the word header. <laughs> <laughs> that will get you a lot of trouble. And so we purchased our first stripper headers in 2010. In fact, encouraged our custom harvester to bring stripper headers, so we've stripped all of our small grains since then. I think, in my opinion, strippers are the next step in a no-till environment. It really takes your, your program ahead. And it's just really about maintaining that residue. Uh, and then, as Angie said, two years ago we started using some multi-species covers and are trying to uh, work through that. Uh, see what we can learn there. Uh, as I mentioned, when we made our decision, to go, to go full no-till in 2005. This was a, something that played a very important uh, part of that decision. We, there at Fernan, uh, we have a uh, extension service, and Stan Beavers is an economist there, and Stan has been great to work with. We would have some producer meetings, and it was basically we'd go to a steakhouse, we'd buy a steak. We had some guys that had played with no-till, had some knowledge of no-till and cost, they had been tillage, we had some guys that were thoroughly convinced about staying full tillage. And so we just had discussions about what it cost, what was, uh, what you needed to have to get the job done, what it cost. And those, some of those meetings almost turned into fights and arguments. But it was really good because everybody that was there was dedicated to find the answer. So through some really good discussion, then Stan put together budgets. Now what we were doing, if you attract those budgets, Till and no-till was just pretty much running right together. Cost was about the same. And like I said, everybody started looking at this, they were thinking about a cost factor. Along in about 2005, this was the budget the stand put together. And if you'll see, there was about a $15 advantage to, to no-till. Now, if you look, the return on both of those is red. <laughs> That's scary. But now you got to understand a couple things. That was back in an environment of $4 wheat. There was no <laughs> livestock income in those budgets. And Stan is a tough, tough budgeter. I mean, he's going to look at family living costs, everything. And so those were tough budgets. But I'm going to tell you what. Our budget on that was a 3,200-acre wheat farm. And $15 an acre, that's $48,000. So that, we, we said then, that trips the scale for us and we made the decision. What was happening along there about that time was patents were running out on Roundup and other herbicides. Herbicide costs were coming down. Fuel prices were going up. The price of steel from John Deere and International and other equipment manufacturers were going up. And so we finally uh, saw that roll over. Now, as we go down that highway, we talked about going to Oklahoma City. Where are we going here? And this is where we're headed. We want to achieve a healthy, viable, thriving, living soil for our production. Now, if I were to ask you to describe that, uh, okay, let's, let's say we're going to talk about life. I want you to describe the life in that picture. You would probably say, well, I see a man. He's obviously alive. That earthworm's alive. And they say the soil is alive. So there's three forms of life there. No, there are billions of forms of life there. There are literally billions of fungi and microbial bacteria and all those living within that soil. And we need to learn how to manage that environment better. As we want to walk down this road, this path we're on, what are some of the obstacles that we could run into? And I just, you know, not all the obstacles, but here's the three I think of. And you think the sun's an obstacle? 
Well, it can be. The rain, the wind. We're going to talk about these guys. Think, look at that guy. I mean, I can kind of, it's kind of been chilly in here all day. I can kind of warm up to that just looking at it on the screen. That's hot. You've heard some of these guys talk about temperatures and on the soil and those things. I can remember in Wichita Falls, Texas, watching the 10 o'clock news and the temperature at 10 o'clock given on the news 100 degrees. And it's hot when it's like that. Now, you know, we, we, we fuss about the sun. But this is what we do, guys. We harvest that energy, the energy from the sun, combined with nutrients from the soil and water, and we grow food for a population. And without that, we have nothing. All we have to do is learn how to better manage it. And we can manage it better with covers. This wind is just ruinous. I've never liked this thing. Uh, I guess if you've got a bunch of wind generators, there's a lot of benefit from it. And there are some benefits to agriculture, but I just can't like it. Uh, we've got that raindrop there. Uh, you know, and I'm sure you guys are going, how can you fuss about a raindrop? And, you know, it, it's, it's hard, but we'll find a way. Uh, we need the rain. I don't need the drop. We need the moisture, but I don't need the effects of that. Look at what's going on there. That drop is impacting, and you have a miniature explosion. It's literally blowing out those soil particles, that organic matter, those nutrients. And you think, well, that's no big deal. That's a raindrop. Now let's put billions of them out there. And you see what we have happening. You have an explosion occurring in your field. How do we fight these things? Right here. We cover it. We provide cover for that soil. I want to show this to you. You think, well, that's just another picture of cover. Let me see if I can get this pointer to work. Look right here. No, it's not, I'm not doing it right. Uh, right there along that road, what do you see? You see weeds. Do you see weeds out in that field anywhere? So that cover does a tremendous job of suppressing that weed pressure. And that's another thing the covers can do for us. Here's another picture of cover. Now, that, I'm pretty sure that's a combine track. We have drills on the combines, you kind of see two tracks. And you see about probably two foot of standing stubble, that's stripper stubble. Now, if that sun ray is coming down, it doesn't impact the soil. It impacts that stubble. So the soil doesn't get hot, the stubble gets hot. It absorbs that energy. Then the wind blowing through there radiates that energy away. Hey, wait a minute, we found some use for the wind. So we help lower the soil temperature. We help lower that evapotranspiration. The same thing happens with that raindrop. When that raindrop comes down and hits that soil, now I get the benefit of the rain without the damage of the drop. It trickles down that stem and gets to the soil and I don't have to have the damage of the raindrop. Some of the tools that we can use to get that done are this, there's a no-till seeder, and this is what I want to see. When I'm planting my next crop, I love to see residue up there rubbing that bar. That soil is still protected. I'm putting another crop in there, and the soil is still protected. Here's a planted field, a 30-inch row planted summer crop. I want to see that kind of cover so that we don't have the damage from those those guys out there. Here is a photo of a October issue of Dryland No-Tiller. Jim took this photo on my place last August. He, uh, uh, we, were, we were out there and I think you can see that's probably head high or something. And what I want to try to emphasize to you here is in Texas with these temperatures, and the wind and the other things, it's difficult to keep these residues around. So we had a multi-species cover crop. You can see heads from millets. The day we did this, I made the statement that I think I waited too long to terminate this. Today, I realized I didn't wait too long. It was fine. Uh, I don't know if it would have benefited us waiting longer, but we sure didn't wait too long. This, this was taken the 14th day of August, the day we did the, the tour. 
We actually terminated that crop the following day on the 17th day of August. We had a 4830 John Deere sprayer, had a backup camera, magnetic mounted underneath it. We took the camera off of the sprayer that day. The, the, the residue wiped the, the camera out. So that's what kind of residue we had there. Here is a picture. Uh, this is actually mid-September. We're running through that residue, putting in ammonia to get ready to plant a wheat crop. Here is right behind that rig that we're running. It's an ammonia rig. And you can see we probably still have a couple foot of residue there uh, behind that rig. So we're laying some of it down. If you look out in front of that tractor, it's maybe six foot tall, four, oh, five or six, something like that. And, but we still got a couple foot standing. This was last week. That's what we've got left. You can see some residue, obviously big stalks laying on the ground. It's planted in wheat. That's the wheat we have growing. This is last week. What are some of the tools we can use to help us maintain that cover on those fields? To maintain the cover so we can protect it from the rain, the sun, and that wind. Guys, you've heard it said by several producers here today, a stripper header is extremely valuable in Texas. Now, I've heard it said in some areas, they don't like strippers. Strippers conserve too much moisture. They make the soil too wet. They can't dry it out. That's not my problem in North Texas. So we want to conserve all the moisture we can. One of the things that helped us make that decision to purchase that stripper header was a study that was done by a gentleman named Dietrich Castens. And Dietrich lives up in very northwestern Kansas. This was a three-year study that he did on his farm. Now, Dietrich's dad was a researcher for Kansas State University. Dietrich was not employed by Kansas State, but he was doing this work through the Kansas Agricultural Research Association. It's uh, called CARA. And uh, if people that know Dietrich talk about him being a relentless guy for details. He really is a detailed researcher. He wants, and I've had phone conversations with Dietrich on the phone about this. And I asked him, I said, Dietrich, what did you really want to see out of this? And he said, all I ever want is the truth. I want the facts. I just want to know what's what. So, uh, and here is his results from that study. They were planting corn behind stripped wheat. In 2006, with a 35 bushel corn crop, so it's obviously pretty dry in his area, they showed a 5.3 bushel yield increase where they stripped it. Now in 2007, they had some pretty good rain. They grew almost 120 bushel corn. He's only, he has got a one bushel yield decrease where he stripped it. But if you look over here to the confidence in his study, he only has about a 70% confidence in his study. So he was seeing some variations in his plots that was troubling him. Now if you come down here to 2008, when he's back to 101 bushel yield, pretty good corn, he's got a 9.6 bushel yield increase, and he's got a 99.6% confidence level in his test. His tests were very accurate. So, in visiting with Dietrich over the phone, another thing he tells me, they also looked at yields on Milo planted behind the corn behind the strip or straight cut wheat. They saw yield increases on the milo following the corn on the stripper header. So strippers can be a very valuable tool in no-till operation. This is our stripper last year. We had drought out wheat. We're stripping five bushel wheat here. Don't ask me why. We just were. <laughs> and you can see, you think, well, I don't see any difference in where you stripped it and you didn't. And sometimes you have to ask yourself that question. But in visiting with Dietrich over the phone, he said, we saw the very same thing. They saw improvements where they run a stripper header or a straight cut header. He said, my neighbors in this drought, the straight cut had land blowing. Where I stripped it, I did not. So you always can see advantage. Another tool we can use is this, uh, this fertilizer rig. This is an Xactrix rig that we built. It's ammonia only. It's a 60-foot rig. We're using a Case SDX opener. There are no shanks on this rig. That's a photo of the opener. 
Uh, it's a disc opener. We just slice the soil open about 70 degrees, inject it in there, and close the slot. Uh, this opener has a wheel beside the blade. That's a huge advantage. It holds that soil down. This is actually the third version of opener that we had on this rig. Here is the first version. This was a Borgo opener. And we were actually putting ammonia into growing wheat here. And if you'll see, we have way too much disturbance here for me. I'm damaging too much wheat and doing too much disturbance to the soil. Because here we don't have a wheel by that blade. It's not holding it down so the blade is ripping that soil out. And so we don't like that much disturbance. Another tool we use is we use a strip-till rig as a, as a soil warrior. There are no shanks on this rig. Some have heard me say this. I, I view using a strip-till rig as a mission of failure. And why do we use it here? Well, we run cattle on our cover crops, and one time when it gets wet, we will get a hoof impact in some areas. And if you're trying to plant cotton an inch deep, and an inch and a half cattle track, it's not very good. So what we do, we'll go into some of those fields, we'll just run that system, it just kind of fluffs a furrow. We don't try to go deep, we're just trying to fluff a seed bed. I'm not worried about compaction. That cattle compaction is just not a big issue to me. I just don't think it's that big of a deal. This is really not a good picture, it was the only one I had of where we'd run this rig. We weren't really running the rig here, this was just some Small grains covered, we just got it put together, and we were just out there trying it, see if we could get it to work. But we're just fluffing a raised area there, smoothing out those problems, and then hopefully if we get some rain, we can come in there and plant. Uh, this is our no-till cedar. Uh, we actually bought two of these cedars new a couple years ago, and we took them to the house and rebuilt them. We just bought them, took them home, tore them apart, rebuilt them, to make them do the job we wanted to do. One thing, you say, well, what, what's, how can you, what can you do in your cedar to preserve residue? You can make choices and selections. For example, here we chose a 10-inch cedar over a 7.5. Uh, there's one-third fewer openers on a 10-inch cedar than there is a 7.5. Uh, you've got one-third fewer calls, one-third fewer blades. It's a lot easier to work on them and your cost of purchase is less, and it preserves more residue, leaves more residue standing after you seed. We took it home and, re oh, what did I, did I miss a picture? Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is uh, of the work that we did to those openers. We removed the OEM uh, wheels and replaced them with a, with a Martin gauge wheel. It has a steel wheel, so the, the bearing is not placed in plastic. As the deer is, we get a lot better performance out of that. The middle wheel, the infer wheel, we remove the John Deere OEM wheel and replace that with a Needham V8 wheel. It's a narrower wheel, gives you much better seed to soil contact so you get better emergence. And we take the closing wheel off the back and replace it with the Martin Crumbler wheel. And we feel like we get a lot better closing action with that crumbling action as opposed to just the OEM straight uh, steel wheel. Here is a picture of that pressure gauge. Uh, wait a minute, I missed that, didn't I? No, we got one more. There we go. Picture of the pressure gauge on that cedar. If you'll notice, deer, when they manufacture that, they've got a little green section in there. That's where they, they, they say this is a safe range to run it in. And then they've got a little orange range. That's the danger, you know, or caution. And then the red, the danger. We always run it in the red. We run it standing straight up, 1,500 pounds. And the only reason we don't run higher than that is because you got to lift in the cedar. Now, you say, well, you know, is your ground that hard? No, it's not that hard. But we want to take the bounce out of that system. We want to get that cedar tied to the ground so we get optimum seed to soil contact, and that's the kind of the pressure range you need to be in. Sometimes if we get on some of our real sandy soils, we'll drop that pressure down to, uh, to the thousand pounds right above the green. Here's another photo of that cedar. Uh, you see we've placed oil field weights on the back. Deer put some brackets on there to put weights on. They put them in the wrong place. You don't need weight on the front of that cedar. You need it on the back. If that cedar's gonna lift, it's gonna lift in the back. If you apply pressure to that hydraulic system, you're gonna see it lift, it's gonna lift in the back. So that's where you need the pressure. I also take a picture of this 
We add onto that wing and put that angle on there because I don't see very good. I've knocked wings off of cedars. And that really helps, you know, keeps the poles up and stuff, so it helps to have a little slide on there. This is some winter cover crop that we planted this last year. This is a, a mix that we did. Uh, you can see we have pretty good cover from our drought up wheat crop last year. This is another picture of that same field. We've still got straw cover there. And uh, we're pleased that we think we got a pretty good mix there of, of the winter uh, uh, grains and then the, the brassicas and, and the uh, legumes as well. Here's a, this is not this same field. This is a different field, a little tighter soil. And we didn't have good, quite as good a stand there, but this is lighter and you can see we got some pretty good growth on it. For those of you guys, that have grown cotton or know about cotton, have been around cotton, you know that there's, you take a lot of, of, uh, of residue away when you raise cotton. This is this year after we harvested cotton, we had our cover crop in there and terminated and cotton planted, and we've already run a no-till cedar over this and planted small grains. We still have pretty good residue. You can see some soil in there. I don't like to ever see the soil but we have some pretty good cover here. Another tool that we'll use, and I've uh, mentioned that we have livestock, we're running stalker cattle on wheat. Last year we set up our first rotational grading system, and this is gonna be the second one that we set up this year. You can see the yellow is the outside perimeter of the farm. Uh, as you'll look kind of down at the bottom, there's a pond there, and you'll see a waterway through the middle of that. What we'll do is we'll double fence, or use a, a electric fence, double wire, but it'll be a permanent electric fence. We're gonna put it in there, it'll be a permanent installation. We want to get out. We'll erect corners and gates so that you can open a gate to every one of those paddocks. And then those blue stripes that you see across there will just be uh, temporary electric fences that we can throw up in a day. So that field is planted in beardless barley today. We intend to graze it out. When we throw those temporary fences up, there'll be about 40 acre paddocks. And if you can, you know, I am no way is getting to the point that Gabe is talking about, where he's talking about limiting access to the hours. But we're going to just limit movement of these livestock. Livestock just seem to roam and graze and forage too much. And they do more damage, or they do about as much damage as what they eat. So we want to limit their movement. And not only you're limiting movement, but you're resting uh, the rest of the field while you're doing that. So we can actually stay on each one of these paddocks about four days, there'll be eight paddocks in there. By the time we come around, you know, we'll have over a month's rest on that. If you're gonna erect one of these systems, a good charger is good to have. This is one we put together uh, it's a Speedrite 1800i. We, uh, that charger calls for about a 120 watt solar panel. This is a 160 watt panel. Uh, and uh, you'll see these corners that we put in. Uh, this is a bunch of scraps, what it is actually. That's two and three eighths oil field pipe. Down close to the ground, we cut a piece of two and seven eighths and collar it so that it's, uh, it has more strength at the ground level. Then we get, it's, it's a three inch uh, high thickness oil field poly pipe. It's a thick wall poly. It fits right over the top of that three eighths. We drive it down on there and cut a groove in it for the wire. We tie it on and that makes a permanent installation uh, for that fence. Uh, here we are, te I'm testing this charger that day. This is last week, that's 11 kilovolts. That's 11,000 volts. Cattle don't mess with that. Here is a, uh, a, uh, a gate that we put in, we'll hot wire off of that gate. That'll be one of the dividing fences. You just tie onto that, run across the field, put it up, and then you can just open and close that gate to access to the paddock. We have an opener built on there to, to help, help uh, you know, access the closing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, and you know, they said, uh, they said uh, Scott said no till paid him to, or no, they didn't pay him. So they, they encouraged him to make a plug, and I'm not there. They didn't encourage me. I was just going to do it. If you guys want a resource to help you figure these things out, and where do I go in the future, 
There's a seminar coming up in Salina, Kansas. It's uh, January the 27th and 28th, no till on the plains. And guys, it's an amazing meeting. There's a lot to learn, there's a lot of good speakers, and it's worth your time and effort. The day after that, there's a meeting called the AIM Symposium. And we attended that for the first time last year, and it's a great meeting as well. I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, another great resource tied to No-Till on the Plains. This is a, what is happening to some of our screens? <laughs> anyway, there is a picture of Dwayne Beck. Dwayne runs Dakota Lakes Research Farm. Uh, one of the probably the most amazing things that we were ever a part of was in uh, 2009, we went on No-Till on the Plains Point North Tour. And we got to go through Kansas and the Dakotas, and we went to Beck's Farm. And on that bus was Mr. Ray Ward. And I say going on that bus trip with Ray Ward is equivalent to a Bachelor of Science degree in soil science. <laughs> that guy, he's a teacher, and he just stands up and preaches the whole time. You'll be going down there, and Ray will stand up, and he'll say, Guy, back in the... 1600s, the glaciers come down through here and pushed up this over here, and this mountain and this soil type, and it's, it's just amazing. So uh, I would encourage you to look into those. Uh, the Points North Tour, going to Becks, and No Tell on the Plains are great places that you can learn. Okay, if I've not said anything that's of any good to any of you so far, uh, now I want you to listen to this. Many of you probably have seen a rainfall simulator in here. Uh, what a rainfall simulator accomplishes is they take a soil of similar type or the same type, maybe various management practices, till versus no-till, various covers, and they spray water on it, and you collect what runs off, and you get to see the different amounts that run off, and you get to see how much soil runs off in the, the collected water. It's very powerful to see that, to visualize that yourself. Probably one of the best ones that I've seen done was done at No-Till on the Plains by NRCS. They did a very good job, it's very powerful. Now, let me tell you what's more powerful than that. When you see it in real life on your own farm. And we were afforded the opportunity to do that. In 2013, this is where I live. Down here at the bottom, you'll see that pond that my house is in the middle there. There's kind of a, a, pat, a, a terrace wrapped around the hill. And you'll see this green field up here. There's kind of terraces wrapped around this way. That's a hill. And you see a drainage area through there. And guys that work with me know I won't leave things alone. So it was 2013. All these ponds were dry. So we cleaned those ponds out. We had mud spilled everywhere. This over here to the right is a slough. That slough was dry. So we dug it out into a pond and spread the dirt out and filled, filled up the lower areas and just fixed that all up. And me, I said, okay, while we're at it, we've got this crooked fence here. Why don't we straighten that fence up and do some critical area shaping in here and put that area in the field because that's really good soil down there. So that's what we did. So you see that little triangle shape here. <clears throat> So you get a picture of that in your mind. Here where my house is, the hill, it's very high. Over here to the left in the field, it's, it's high. Now we plow this pasture up, we're going to reseed it to Bermuda. So as we were planting the Bermuda, we scattered some hay grazer seed in the Bermuda gas sprays. Just let them trickle out, and when it rained, they come up so we could have some cover. You'll see that here. This is a photo that I was taking later that summer in 2013. And you'll see that hay grazer coming up. This is out in my backyard looking down there. Now you'll see water standing there. Now, what I really want to emphasize to you, that field area back there, I guess had been plowed for, farmed for, I don't know when that land was broken out, 80 years ago, 100 years ago. Had been farmed for 80 to 100 years until 2005 when we went no-till. This little triangle area that I showed you a while ago that we broke out had never been farmed in its life <clears throat> until two weeks before. 
We came in there with the moving soil, pushing it around, moving fence lines, dragging it, and it was rough. So we would plow it and drag a beam and plow it and harrow it. We abused it. We abused it in the worst kind of way. Okay. That's looking off to the east. You see water standing. This is looking off to the west. You see water standing. Okay? We're going to go back, I hope. There we go. That area right in there in that field, that's flat as a table. In fact, if you look right there at the edge of that picture, you'll see a dark area. But we actually did some work training that area. It was wood and drains. We actually cut a channel through there to help it drain. You think, we got a pretty good rainfall event. We got water standing. But I got a rain gauge right up here where I took that picture three tenths of an inch. Do you see water standing in that field out there where I'm no-tilling? I got three tenths of an inch of rainfall, and that land that I abused, I've got water standing all over it, and out there where we're no-tilling, there's no water standing. Go back, same thing over here. You can see the area is getting wider. That's that triangle we did. And because my house is on a hill, when you walk out the back door and you go, wow, what just happened here? Why do I have this? I'm like, I, got, I must have got an inch and a half of rain. I walked to the rain gauge, I got three tens. Well, what's going on here? This is a picture of my mismanagement. I mismanaged and abused that soil so badly but look at what happened to the soil where we had improved management. Okay, I'm sorry. There we go. Thank you for your time, attention, attendance. Appreciate it. Thanks.